Welcome to Panyangis.com. I'm going to tell you a little story. So I first discovered our latest guest through drum and bass music back in Bristol about 15 years ago. I was a bit young then to know he was also a graffiti artist and now a fine artist, but I soon learned about this. Uh, both a musician and a visual artist providing an insightful social commentary with strong support for keeping creativity within the cities and the schools, education in the UK and I'm sure all over the world. Basically this man is a legend and one of my idols, someone who's kept me pushing and made a success of what they love. Personally, this is someone who I look up to in all aspects, the music, the art, the words, also recently the yoga, coming from a normal, unprivileged background, yet fighting his way to the top of many, many games. It's really inspiring. He continue, continues to motivate me, and I'm sure many, many others, such a hero. Now opening and curating his very own art gallery in Bangkok called Aurum, we are extremely honored to speak with Goldie. Panyangis.com and we are super honoured to be joined by Goldie. Thank you so much. It's a massive honour for me. Are you in Phuket at the moment? I am indeed. I've, I've had a day off today, so I've been up on the mountain. Okay, hiking, nice. As usual. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm spending a lot of my so-called retirement, which didn't work out that well, as usual. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, I've been very, very busy with a lot of the projects. We've got a lot of projects on the moment. So I like to, I do like to keep myself busy. I must say, I like to complain about it, that I, I've got very little time, um, but I'm probably the the uh, the main culprit for instigating many riots inside this head of mine at some point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, it's been very, very busy with lots of different things. Um, um, yeah, and I'm up to Bangkok tomorrow. No, on, Friday, on Saturday I'm at the gallery uh, for about four days, going over the new material from the new artists and doing a few bits and pieces. Congratulations on the gallery. Before I uh, ask you a question, can I presume that Aurum is the Latin meaning for gold? Is this why you called it that? Ta da! Yay. Yeah, uh, lots of people don't get it. I mean, obviously, a lot of Asian people just don't quite get that. Well, I wouldn't expect them to unless they've studied Latin. Um, but yes, it was always uh, a title I wanted to use many years ago, Aura Metallica being the composite. Um, and yes, and I just like the idea of Aurum. Very, I'm very old fashioned in that sense. So I, I, I like that. And of course, the idea of of gold being a very pure metal as opposed to a poison, um, which you know is something that I, I, I quite I quite like to key and, and toy with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this why you honed the name Goldie for yourself from the very beginning? Oh no, that was I, but I was studying street, not Latin. So no, that was just Goldilocks. <laughs> so, yeah. I, used to, I used to have dreads and I used to call me Goldilocks, and my hair was very light. So that was really that. The gold came later. <laughs> much later mm -hmm. um yeah that came a lot later mm -hmm. um but i was always called goldilocks for, for many years and then i cut my locks and had one lock and then it just became goldie as opposed to goldilocks mm -hmm. okay let's talk about the gallery um the firstly goldie how do you pick artists um i mean I've, i i i'm just really old-fashioned uh, in a lot of ways but to be honest you know my partner said to me look do you want me to do, do a gallery and I'm like well I've toured with the idea before but if I'm going to do a gallery it has to be with the artists that I love and of course that's that's a given to be honest all of the artists are my friends I mean it's pretty much mm. they're either fans or friends um which kind of you know, you, you, you try and, I think coming to Thailand and Asia in general was an idea, I think for me, of reinvention. I think every artist at any point in their lives has to reinvent to to be, to be to kind of take it out of the parody, if you like, because there's been many guises of me in many different things. Um, and I think reinvention, the, the idea was to come to kind of retire, but that, 
it wasn't really retirement as in I'm not going to be working anymore but I don't really class what I do as work anyway I've never had a job so you know Sunuk Rushi would have very a very hard job skill trying to make retrain me to do anything I know all, yeah. I've, ever, all I've ever done um, is oh, I've never had a real what you call a real job I always knew that I would I would hustle. I was always a hustler, so I always hustled on road, doing different things, um, some good, some bad. But the idea of, you know, even even when I was printing t-shirts, I would sell shirts out the back of a car, or I would tie-dye shirts, or I would, you know, make jewelry. I, I learned the craft of making jewelry really early on. I mean, I was making jewelry Jesus, I was making jewelry at like 25, 26. When I've been to New York the first time, and I went the second time I went to Miami, I was always fascinated with with crafting gold, um, working in the flea markets with a, a company called New York Connection, which is very much alive now, a guy called Orlando Pleen. He has an Instagram and, he, and they, 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 he's the original maker of gold teeth gold fronts as we call them going all the way back into the into the early 80s of just ice and those guys record sleeves he used to have a, a, a an amazing eddie who was the main brother there were five brothers from Suriname that came to the u.s one went to jacksonville and atlanta one went to new york one went to miami and i met with orlando was in miami so the brothers had learned this skill of making goals and I got to meet Orlando in the flea market, which has just been knocked down, believe it or not, after all these years. Flea market USA number one. So I I was airbrushing at the time. I did sort of a lot of airbrushing and that kind of transcended into doing like whips and rides. A lot, a lot of crazy dealers or, you know, crazy hood man that were wanted mad stuff painting on their trucks. So that kind of transitioned from, from painting t-shirts and Orlando was always late he'd always have something that made him late so I'd always as a Virgo picked up on the skill set of taking moles taking prints investment cement uh, creating the wax wrapping the wax around the molars cutting it with a, with, a, with a surgical blade creating the designs then investing into metal tubes then putting into a centrifugal casting machine Melt, melting the gold with oxygen and acetylene, you know, and of course it's a different gold than normal jewelry gold, which contains iron, it contains zinc. So all of these things that I'd learn, you know, is the alchemy of it. I'd always learn art through the alchemy of um, changing something that was solid into another form. And there's nothing more pure than gold to do that. Changing its actual frame, its, its shape. And casting, which is the pure art of the craft of, of, of making jewellery. So I learned, I picked that, that skill up. And of course, when it started transitioning into larger pieces of jewellery, I kind of zoomed out. Because I'd already I'd already started doing like rings early on. Like I, I mean, in my wedding ring, I, you know, it's like an ounce, an ounce. I'd, I'd carved in wax and made. I'd made some really spectacular pieces. It's a very famous piece that Kim Mazel is very famous single lost. She said she'd lost it, but it was a, a soul to soul ring. I think it's out there somewhere on the internet. It was a, a ring I made for Nellie Hooper that she'd lost. And that was, I mean, that was an ounce and a half that piece. It was a pretty weighty piece of jewelry. Um, I made some really great crafted pieces. And so I'd, I'd learned the skill of that. And that kind of gave me this whole, this whole idea of, 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 of goldsmithing really. Um, and then of course that just went on to other things really. And, and I kind of, I was, I was kind of coming out of graph then in, in, I was, I was spent a lot of time as my, my youth doing graph. I've always been a writer. It's never been a thing. What I've not, I've never been, I've always been a writer from the age of 17 and a half since Subway Art. It was, it was the main, you know, the main book that changed my life and changed a lot of our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was very important. So trying to, come back to the question how do I pick all the people within the gallery a lot of them are my association with New York 
when I was 18, Tats Crew has always been my crew. I've just finished a really wonderful Sky Arts documentary, which I'm going to be showing at the gallery, I think on November the 17th through to the 20th. I'm going to do three evenings. And it's a really beautiful Sky Arts documentary. Um, it's called Sky Arts, uh, The Art That Made Me. And it's, it goes from the journey of traveling to New York and going all the way and it ends it starts in new york with henry chalfont at the bronx uh, museum where henry chalfont who was the photographer for subway art along with um david sylvan who produced the documentary um uh, subway art uh and with all of that james pringoff and martha cooper this book that changed our lives kind of cemented this relationship um, transatlantic with, with Tats crew and of course ever since then we've always I kind of ventured into music and when I was on tour in the US they'd come and see me and whether it was Jane's Addiction or Bjork they'd come to the tours we did um, and I'd always I'd always kept drawing and kept writing so everyone that's kind of pre or um, are kind of my friends and people that are post the people like Berlin that, that have always was also, was also painted with Howard Nozem who, who were part of Tats crew, my same crew from Germany. They kind of took over when I left the US and went into music, Howard Nozem went from Germany to live in New York. So they kind of replaced me, so to speak. And and it's just been, a, it, it really is that. It's, it's a very tight community, the contemporary art community that we know. I mean, even if you look at uh, Mr. Banks, and you look at what he's doing. He was under the wing of Inky and 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 3D for Massive Attack, you know, from Bristol. So there's all the, it's all there if you if you look closely. And I think what the documentary does, without going too far off track, is it gives you a really great connection, which people which took we took for granted, you know, because we grew up with it. We grew up with the book. We grew up with the writers. We grew up with Henry. I've grown with these people, and they became great friends. In the same way that Groove Rider, Fabio, I was a fan and we became friends because the music took me to that level. And I think that's one thing that I'd always managed with B-Boys and that you look in a book and you realize that dream could be achieved. I, that, I saw that book and thought, I just want to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm just going to do it. And I, I had a conversation with Crash, John Matos, um, for anyone that's watching this. He's probably the oldest, one of the oldest members of Tats crew in terms of, you know, the father crew, which is Tats, which um, which is Bio, Nice, BG, and the extension goes into other writers, into 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 Crash and into Howard Nozem, in, in, into uh, you know lots of other writers that are associated that are down with the crew. But I mean, Crash was telling me a wonderful story that, you know, Eric Clapton on one of the evenings where he won seven Grammys, decided to call him up and say, look, I want you to show me the Bronx, to show me around for a, for a video shoot. And this is Eric Clapton called him up and said, look, it's Eric, can you show me around the Bronx? And he put, you laughed and put the phone down. You know, I think, I think back then, even those artists that were mainstream artists, without the bullshit of social media and without all of this stuff, there's a lot of true artists back then that would would really want to be connected to real stuff that was happening in New York. And that kind of not died its death, so to speak. Oh, you could you could you could look at it in the same way of going, well, you know, the idea that uh, Storms is wearing Banksy's body vest, which is great. There's an association where an artist reaches out to another artist and and and, and really makes some noise and makes a statement and you, and, they, and it's both and it serves a purpose for both entities. I think that happens every so often in, in culture which is a really good thing. So trying to get back to answer that very big question for you, because I never answer a question in, in that kind of way. It's never been my way of doing things. But the idea of Aurum Gallery is a labor of love of where you have a space, not unlike a museum, because I don't like the idea of contemporary being in a shoebox. I've always felt that the claustrophobia of you know, I've spent my life in, in, in a care institute. I've spent my life in dormitories. I've spent my life in these places. 
having the ability with a fantastic partner where we have a hundred percent um commitment in terms of what we buy as opposed to a consignment for example we're probably one of the only galleries in in asia that we've everything that's in that gallery we own mm. there is no consignment in that gallery um that may change with the current covid times because a lot of artists are desperate just to put their work into the gallery um but i think that the artists that i love Saturno, Berlin, Vils, these are people that kind of grew up on my music and they know me from old school and they're big fans. And once I get through the shit, man, I'm a fan, I love the music, love them, like, right, yeah, I want to get some, I want to get some art. You know, we, we get that out of the way, but it, it, it is down to business in terms of how can we show in an, in an area which has its own culture also. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of great graffiti writers, another question you have on your list. Yeah. There are a lot of graffiti writers that are homegrown, you know, Love Letters, you know, all these other guys, P7. There's a lot of other artists that I actually don't know personally, but I know a lot of these artists get up and they, and they have a certain style within their own thing. Um, it may not be, it may not be something we register with straight away, but street culture is exactly that. It, it adapts to its environment and it adapts to its architecture. So that's something that, that it's not something that I thought, well, I'm gonna open a gallery. I just need to go and check out every graffiti writer. You know, it's, it's, it's the when a guy hits me on Instagram and says, yo man, I got some cans. Let's just go and throw down. It's like, yeah, you're 17 and I'm like 55. Like go chill, go climb the wall yourself. You know, it's like you get, you know, when it's when it's time to throw down, believe me, when it's time to paint, we paint. It's the same as in Miami, when the when, it, when we get the camera crew away and then they drop in on us, we're getting busy because that's something that you don't forget how to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the great thing about Bangkok is that there's there's a couple of kind of slight hall of fames that are kind of happening. You know what I mean? It, it's sort of cowboy, that road, if you go all the way down to the very end, there's a couple of good spots where people are painting and getting up and that's good for the culture it's it's amazing for the culture especially in a, in a in a society where it's not deemed arrestable and you can lose your life or four or you're going to lose all of your social credits and no longer going to be able to do anything and blacklisted so it's certainly easier for for a lot of writers to kind of get up but it's also good that other writers don't have the same stigmas that we had to face. You know, you put a stencil on a canvas and you were you were you were you were a devil. You were like an underling. You use a bit of tape or masking tape on a contemporary piece of work, work or a wall, and you were de deemed a leper. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> we had such a hard time because it was all about the university of the street and graffiti and the old form and everything else. We get that. But once you've done your university of the street, surely you reach a, a glass ceiling of your own choice. Mm. And I think then as an artist, you need to be able to expand. And I think part of my expanding as an artist was to expand sonically. And I mean, for example, whoever your subscribers are, they could go and listen to Mother or Stormtrooper or St. Angel and they wouldn't get it because it's still a very alien music. But you may like Adore You, because of course, Adore You is a tune that will say to you, ah, oh, this is yeah. how I put it into a format that you may understand. It's like, oh, I love that record, great. Yeah. But the difference between that record and another record is that you might think that record sounds the same as this vocal track, when in actual fact, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, because the difference is that that record has full integrity, because when you listen to another record, you might think, well, hang on a minute, but it's got the same kind of vocal in it. It's the way it lays itself down. It's the same thing as hand style. It's the same thing as style and flow. Those that are in the know that make music, whoever the commercial people are that make that music, that's non-integral out of their own choice because they have no culture to be able to, to even judge it by. If you're just making music and you produce and you've had no drum and bass cultures come through, then it's no, it's no big deal for you. You're making this record, that record, so there's nothing to prove. It's just you're making a record to make money and to, to get a hit. But 
even those people, when they hear that type of music, they go, shit, the production, the way the vocals sit, it's, everything's in the right place. It sounds like it existed before. That's kind of what graffiti is for me. It's what style is for me. It's a, it's a very gray area, that idea. But going back to the gallery and the space, it's the first thing that everyone says. This space is so beautiful. It's an amazing space. And I think sometimes in a world where we are being crushed by this glass ceiling that we didn't design, and all of the stuff that comes with social media. I mean, even my Instagram, I don't take it seriously at all, as you can clearly see. I noticed. <laughs> um, it's because I just don't, I just don't. I, I never, I don't put MBE after my name in anything because I just can't be bothered. I mean, just for me, it just means massive bell end. It's just another blue piece of badge. It's just, you know, it's the same as a professorship or a doctor, you know, I've got double doctor, doc sock, doc sci you know, art and music. That's all it's ever been for me. And it's good because my mother would like it. And secondly, it opens doors where people go, shit, okay, I never knew that. Mm. Um, but I think the idea of what the gallery means is that all of those accolades are nowhere near as powerful as the main accolade of a space that we've created and manifested where I can walk into and it's my gallery with my partner and it's my art and it's my friend's art. Mm -hmm. No better feeling than that. There's yeah. no better feeling than that at all. I bet, yeah. Um, you painted the train with Jex and mm -hmm. one of the things, I don't know if you agree, but like you were saying, in Bangkok and Thailand, the graffiti street art scene is relatively new. They don't have the kind of depth of layer that the UK and the US do from cats crew and Star Wars and spray can art. So it's relatively new and kind of innocent. Um, what was it like to paint with uh, with Jex? I think I, I watched something and you said that he'd never heard of Mode 2 either. So it was- Yeah, really I mean, I mean it's fascinating. Him. It's fascinating that his technique is very much of a new writer where you outline first and cut back. It's called cutting back. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of new writers do that. It's, it's a very good way of, of painting. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's a good technique. His characters are, are his characters, they're his own. But I actually, I actually disagree in lots of ways. I think that it doesn't have to be as layered. It doesn't have to be. And the fact that it has an innocence almost does it itself a favor that it's free from the gravity of judgment. Yeah. And, and I think the old guard of Graffiti Wider you know, and I think that's what's partly executed in his, in his great Sky Arts documentary is that people like Ben Ayn said, we can't, we couldn't keep up with the style of what graffiti's doing. We're not good enough. Sure. But as soon as we kind of changed it and we started doing block letters and using tape and everything else, all of a sudden, one, it was accepted. And two, it gave me a whole other thing that I could go into skill set of letter fonts, which I would have been laughed at, so to speak, by a kind of purist. And I think that's good too, because that we mustn't forget that graffito, not graffiti, graffito, the Latin word is about leaving your mark. It's, and it doesn't matter whether it's a fucking aerosol can, whether it's a piece of lead piping, whether it's a, you know, chalk or whether it's etching or whether it's a needle on a record, or whether it's a, a word coming from your mouth, you know, sonically into a microphone. It's about laying down the art, it's about the freedom of expression. Let's not get it into anything where we've got to go, what's the difference between, well, the difference is a set of freedoms that we've spent so many years painting for nothing, so many years painting for free. I spent so many nights cutting dub plates and paying people and paying out of my own pocket to go and give it to a DJ. What do you think, I asked the DJ for 30 quid or 50 quid if it was a 12 inch? Great record, mate. There you go. But can you give us 50 quid? Because I just got to go and pay the guy to cut it. That's not how culture works. No. So the idea of laying down and the idea of it's finally time for us, for people to realise and play catch up, that if this work goes into someone's home or a canvas, you know, spare me. The next question may be, well, does it change anything? Well, yeah, it changes a lot because it's, it's the fact it's in your front room. Who gives a fuck? 
As far as I'm concerned, there is nothing wrong with the idea of, do you think that if every contemporary gallery's work gets bought in a gallery tomorrow, that no one will get over a fence and paint a wall? In fact, completely the opposite, because that's what culture does. It acts as a counterculture. Mm. There's more illegal pieces gone up, you know, in the last 10 years, it, with the last 15 years around the world, you think about the impact of New York as a train system, then when the world got it through Subway Art, believe me, have you been to, Bo have you been to Bogota? It's destroyed. I mean, it's literally covered like probably five times more than New York's covered. I mean, it's obliterated. Wow. And part of, part of the process of why it was obliterated is because instead of Mayor Koch spending $72 million to eradicate graffiti, the police just went around shooting kids. So what does that say about culture? Culture will adapt, whether it's Big Brother watching us, and Big Brother watching allowed people like Banksy and allowed people that were making poster art to go, Shit, if we just use stencils, we can do this in a fifth of the time and we're in and we're out. We can actually pr produce these posters at home and just print it out, get the glue, go in there, roll it out. There you go, job done. The reason why New York was so powerful and the reason why New York exploded within the main book Subway Art was because New York was on strike. So the train yards for three months wasn't policed. Why? Three months. Three months. Yeah. Three main months. Yeah. Three main yeah. months, there was no one in the yards. And it wasn't about if you could go to the yard and paint. It's whether or not the gang was going to be in there to fuck you up so you couldn't paint. Because it was like gang warfare between who controlled what yards. It's a bit like, it was a bit like the favelas. The police don't go to the favelas in Brazil. A lot of my friends live in Brazil and Sao Paulo. A lot of police won't go into the favelas. They have their own police. And this is how vicious that was. Fast forward, and you ask me about, are we, are, we, are we watering it down by putting it on canvas? Who cares? Because the amount of shit that I've been through with my life to paint walls in the dead of night, freezing my ass off, I, desire, I, de I deserve a little bit of penance. We all do. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it's looked at differently, and the idea that, if you look at PETA, for example, P-E-E-T-A, you cannot say that his work is not impacting architecture in a big way. And I think that you look at what Cobra is doing in New York, amazing stuff. I mean, huge murals, huge, the scaling, the sizing, and the fact that it has become legal in a sense, it's not a bad thing because- I think it's a great- it's like when, yeah. But it's I like when people say, we're making music. Let's say, let's say if a door you went to number one, would I would I complain and say, take it down now. I don't want it to be number one. The fact if it did come to number one, then something might be wrong. So the idea of, of graffiti being the last bastion of hope for, for us all and finally having its day yeah. within the contemporary world. Uh, well, go figure. Look at art through the ages. Isn't it about time? Mm -hmm. You describe, words. It's, it's eight bad time. you describe it as the new renaissance is that right i really liked this this description well, yes i mean it, it is the new renaissance because yeah. if you look at what if you look at what even like you know david hockney and everyone else was doing you know you look at what he was doing with an ipad for example the idea of him painting on an ipad and doing his whole new collection the idea of technology running alongside in a parallax with art has always been has, has always been a thing. We had a wonderful tool called an aerosol can. We managed to manipulate the nozzle to give it different depths to be able to come out in different shades by shaving the nozzle of one can, taking the pressure out of one, mating them together, shaking the one with the most pressure. One's white, one's red with the less pressure. The one with the less pressure, the white goes into the one with the less pressure and creates a pink. I mean, we were doing that 25 years ago. So the idea that Montana come along and all of a sudden we have all of these beautiful shades available, it's, it's development. It's like the Adidas shell top sneaker, it's developed. Yeah. But just people just don't see the connection between fashion and the idea of real culture, which was fashion for us. Mm -hmm. The culture that we know in the 80s is complete fashion. Goose down, leather, bam. 
the hat, Tilted, Pink's Pure Mistakes, the Two Finger Rings. These companies are doing this stuff now. Yeah. There's such a latency. And if you if you go one stage further and you say, okay, well, I don't think it's Renaissance. Okay, fine. So let's take all of everything to do with hip hop culture and anything to do with graffiti, letter fonts included, out of society now. It's a bit of a gray canvas. <laughs> Bit of a, from A to B on your daily trip to work, it's a pretty grey environment. Mm, mm. So the arts, by default, through the Greeks, the barbarians from within, Joseph Reichwert, a very wonderful art critic, said 1972 that the, the art as we know it will change, and it will, you know, the Gainsborough picture, for, uh, uh, adding to that, the cow in the field, for example is no longer the central character anymore. It became the letter font. And then when it wasn't the letter font, it became the icon. It became Coca-Cola, it became Pepsi, it became Tesla, it became all of these signs that we know, Google, emoji. So the idea of when society does this to us and, and it says buy, 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 buy more in this capitalist environment, why aren't, why aren't the artists gonna become more renaissance by creating all of the parodies within it, yeah. whether it's a guy holding dollar signs with Mickey Mouse with a pair of sneakers and golds on, because we've been fed this stuff. Mm. Mm. Disney fed us this stuff to buy into this stuff. Disney didn't make Disney free. They did it to buy into. So, you know, the idea of if you look at it like that, then the art has to respond in a renaissance way. And if you're clever like Mr. Banks, where it has a social impact even more so, and say something politically on the agenda where it actually it actually becomes the real wolf in sheep's clothing right in front of them, shredding a painting before your very eyes at Sotheby's, then that's the purest form of street art you can get. Mm. And everyone else is chasing tail. But the idea of everyone else doing what they're doing and contributing to that change and to the idea of, look, M Moda Gallery, you look at Mocker Gallery in LA and, you know, it was a massive show and Henry had all of these trains there, really big show, artists from around the world. The idea of saying is graffiti art is like saying, it's the most old fashioned comment you could say now. It's an art form, get with it. Because if we looked at any musician, any avant-garde artist at the time, they were often mocked for their work. The difference is there's too many of us now, they can't discard us. <laughs> Yeah, and it's surely, I know you're a big advocate, it's surely better that young people, we can, you know, encourage young people to pick up a spray can or, you know, go to the skate park. I encourage any young artist yeah. to pick up any type of medium. Sure, yeah. Any type of medium that helps with therapy, because to be honest, my story is different. So whatever you do, kids out there, don't believe me. <laughs> find, your, find your own thing, because... You know, my 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 artistic ability comes through trauma. It doesn't come from anywhere else. It doesn't come from being privileged. It doesn't come through, you know, being a trendy contemporary artist. This comes from a privileged family, and there are lots of them. <laughs> but who's to say that people from privileged backgrounds can't paint and express themselves? Yeah. Okay? But surely your impact should be more than. You know, it's like if, when you get into a position of power, then your impact should be even more knockout. That's my view. That's yeah. only my view. My opinion is in everything. And I think that when it comes from trauma, the idea of color and the idea of sound is really a healing mechanism for me. So when I walk into the gallery on Saturday, there's a sense of karmic relief, if you like. <laughs> Because I can go and look at Mad C, who's a wonderful female artist from Germany. And I mean, yeah. even Crash said to me last night, he goes, Goldie, man, guys don't want to paint with her, man. She's, she's a monster. They don't want to paint with her, man. She's crazy. <laughs> but I did like two walls with her, man. She's done two shows at, at Wallworks. She's it was amazing. You know, and I love female artists that have got, that have a lot more to prove also in, in a predominantly male world. And that's why I jumped to Mad C straight away, because she's a powerhouse. You know, I think I think it works way ahead of the curve. I think the idea of graffiti art artists will adapt to their environment culturally because it's just, it's an inborn mechanism. 
the fact that contemporary artists that may not have been have, uh, uh, have, have, have strong with aerosols that have kind of gone more into stencil art, you know, because the freestyle's not quite there, and, but they, they find other things and other methods. And what I like about it, when I spoke to, 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 to Will, you know, Bio, who's my real kind of mentor, you know, he put me under the wing really early. Uh, and I'm older than Will, you know what I mean? But we, we, it's, it's really weird how the age thing in graph is out the window when it comes to mentorship. You can have a, 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 an older guy that's mentored by a stronger writer. It's weird. It's a weird thing. But it's still a respect from an OG perspective. <coughs> but going back to people like Jex, they're at the beginning of a really strong journey if they've been painting for maybe eight, nine years, ten years. You add another 10 years to that and we create something really special. Um, and, you know, we're not the only gallery, contemporary gallery in, in Bangkok, but I think we are a gallery that has created a bit of noise, a few waves, in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, there were amazing plans to bring Saturno, Berlin and Vils. So we're going to come, we're going to just go crazy on this train. You know, because the train would have been painted every month, every two yeah. months, three months. We wanted to repaint the train. That's what we want to do. Yeah. That's still the plan to repaint the train every three, four months. And it's Probably gone six, deep, really. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, that in itself, I mean, I, 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 if it would have been COVID friendly, as in we would have been open. Yeah. There was also this plan of just the train being an installation on its own because the video that was posted yesterday, two days ago, seeing seeing the process of it painted, people go, oh my God, I never realized, I thought it was just painted gold. I'm like, oh my God, it's every square is done with gold leaf. And it's like, well, yeah, that's the whole point of it being a traditional piece. And I, I love that because it's about layering for me. It's always been this complexity of layering, but the depth of the gallery there's a lot of art we have, we're not showing in the gallery, which is just, I mean, wow. mind blowing. We have a lot of art in the back room. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot. Wow. Um, Can I just ask about um, Tony Mogel? Am I saying her name right? I think- Tony uh, Cogdell. Tony Cogdell. That's it. I watched the interview that you did with her, Bristol female artist, just while we were touching on. Yeah. On on female artists, she's great, and uh, you know, she's a lovely old soul. She's great. What did you like about her? I like that she's from Bristol because I was there for ten years, and I like that she was female. <laughs> and because I know, I think there's only a couple others that I saw, and I, I like that she was very warm and really down to earth, and that the art was really layered. And when I read about the art, that you know, she uses a lot of different techniques and layers until they are fluid. And it's really emo emotive. Even the titles yeah. that she gives them are really emotive. I mean, it really is. And I think that as a contemporary artist that she said, look, why, why me? And I'm like, why not? And I'm like, I'm going to buy all your work. I literally wow. bought all of her work that she had available. And I still want to do an evening with Tony for a couple of evenings with just her work. Um, and invite a lot of female entrepreneurs and people just purely because, you know, as a Virgo, I am I am really effeminate. I have a, such a strong effeminate side to me that people just don't associate. But that's the art. It keeps me grounded. And there's nothing wrong with that in a male predominant world. I like the effeminate. But don't fuck with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like the effeminate is what keeps, the, keeps me stable because we, we, it's it's about the male and female energy and i think with art for me the street was always about the, the hood and the guys and the hustle but the corner the corner was always that the hustle that you know was always that but when it came to the art it was always about the mother it was always about giving birth to the arts man you know and i think the mother even with graffiti it's still it's still giving birth it's still all of the arts man it's like it's what it is and it's when I fell in love with Mold's work, when I saw him paint the pregnant woman. And Aye. people were like, oh my God, he's got this pregnant woman in a mask on this massive wall. But he said so much to me because Mold out of everyone is the only artist we couldn't get his work out of Italy. It was in serious lockdown. There were four particular pieces that I had chosen that were on their way to us. And I'm like, oh, so gutted because Mold. 
even in the documentary, it's so beautiful that, you know, me and Mold were rivals for a long time. And the fact that he, I, be, I became his, such a fan to his work, because I don't think, when I look at, I know, I know this is really strong for me to say this, but when I look at Da Vinci and I look at the way that body and form from that era is drawn, if you look at these sketches and the way that he draws the human body within this kind of graffiti text, te text is just, there's something about it for me that's, mm. it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but you know, I mean, you look at the way that he's, he was with the biggest agent at the time, Lazaridis, while Banksy was there, and I think he was his work was getting overlooked a lot. And he's done a lot of gallery shows, a lot of really strong gallery shows, but you have to be into art, you know, not just to flip it, you've got to be into art. To, it's almost like the fine art of graffiti, do you know what I mean? But that's what I like about Tony's stuff, going back to Tony's, that yeah. I love the way that the portraiture is translucent. And it's, and I always said to her, it's almost like you're looking through glass mm. all of the time through these mirrors of your own life and through the characters of your own life. And I, I, I'm just really blown away by Tony's work. Um, you keep talking about being a, a Virgo Goldie. We have a group, we're like a Virgo team here. And it was your birthday on the 19th of September, right? It was indeed. I mean, it's, isn't it quite strange that when I ever get very cold interviews, or like I had the sun last week from the, some guy from the sun digging around digging on the old, the, the, on the question of, you know, the, 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 the Banksy question, all these questions they were trying to throw. And I just completely pulled the rug on this kid because he had this great comment about, he was saying that, it's a great point to this, you know, uh, he, you know, you know, so tell us, I'm like, no, no comment, no comment, no comment. You know, and it's like, oh, well, you know, what's an old guy like you going to New York and doing graffiti for them? Oh, really? So there's a cutoff age for an artist now. <laughs> so every artist over the age of 40, over the age of 50, you've got to cut your hands off, guys, because you're not allowed to paint. And furthermore, I said to him, OK, New York, right. Where do you where do you go on holiday for, as a kid? Oh, tell me. He's like, what would, I said, tell me where you went. He went, Venice. Oh, OK. Where do you go now? He went, Magaluf. I went, oh, Magaluf. My how times have changed. Where would you take your kids to? Oh, well, Magaluf. Oh, so you wouldn't take him to Venice. I take my kids to New York, thank you. Ending him. Didn't like it. Didn't end him. Thank you, like, goodbye. Have a great time. <laughs> but it's always Gemini's usually. I just, I don't know. I get this thing with Gemini's. It's just uh, Tauruses and Gemini's. I'm yeah. a bit weird with that. But it's really weird how, how Virgos and Libras gravitate around. We gravitate around each other a lot. Mm. Cancers. got a lot of good cancers around me, too. You know, I, I, but yeah, it's quite strange. I saw, I think it was Mix Mag did a little uh, thing for you. And sorry, I'm just going back to music now. I don't want to lose the gallery and the art, but I thought it was really cool. And it was one quote, I might quote you wrong, but you said, uh, when you, it's something like when you love jungle and when you're into jungle, then you can go anywhere with it. And it just made me think about your progression and, you know, you would, you know, from the, you know, inner city life from back in the day to the, production now it really mm. does show the what jungle and drum and bass can be it can be so many different things well it's not what wild style can be pure graffiti from the new york trains can be anything it can be any contemporary piece of work you can give a hundred cans to any guy in art school any lady in art school give them a hundred cans and give them a blank wall and go go up, paint it and they'll be lost you can give a graffiti writer those same tools all of the arts and crafts, the tapes, the stencils, the pieces, and we'll exceed. Yeah. Because it's the purest form of art, and it's, that's that's it. It's the, it is the university of the street, and always has been. And that's what it is. You know, I'm that uncle under the stairs that no one wants to invite to the party because he knows he'll tell your kids the truth. That's the bottom line. And I know I'm not here to be loved. I'm not here to be loved. I'm, I'm here to be reckoned with in that respect because I... I I think that my daughter, she loves art, she loves singing. I mean, you know, people will find it, kids will find it. They, they have an in, they have the soul that's in them. You know, my daughter said to me, it's really funny that she found, oops, I did it again, Britney Spears, that her mom found on, 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 a, on, a, on a Spotify, and she's playing it in the car on her way to school. And she's playing it on repeat. I'm like, okay. She's like, yeah, dad, don't you like it? I'm like, yeah, it's a good pop song. It's a very popular record. But he's not the one. I said, what do you mean he's not the one? I went, <laughs> you know, 
you know, it's baby, baby's the one. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Baby, one more time. She goes, what do you mean? And I put it on. He's like, now it's the new fave. So all of a sudden, daddy gets brownie points. And I'm like, if you're going to go to Britney, go to Britney. Mm. Same with anything. If you're going to do it, do it right. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so that was quite funny. But, um, I mean, she's a Leo and she's strong as hell. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, the music is, is sonically the wild style. I mean, we have the studio in Kuala Lumpur. Fallen Tree 100 is, is a powerful medium. There's, a, there's some really powerful stuff that's going to happen. I can't quite say yeah. um, with one of our fan, one of our artists, which is huge, and a few of our developing artists that you know I'm, I'm helping production with and doing stuff. You know, Asquello came out. This is coming out this Friday, um, which I think Pete's on played on his show on Friday. You know, Metal Heads the labels 25 years deep, and you know it's 25 years, and of course Timeless has been remastered now. That's out at the end of January. And that was real good fun remastering that album because it sounds incredible. After 25 years, we thought, how can we make it sound any better? Well, we kind of have because what we didn't want to do was what we call smash it sonically because you can do that now. You can do certain things. We didn't want to do that. We just wanted to enhance it. Things like Sea of Tears are enhanced now and they're sharper. Whereas Timeless is ridden through the Sonics. So it just has a, it has a different riding through the dynamic now, which we're allowed to, I can ride through. A bit like the way that I conduct an orchestra, you can, you can just push certain places now in the, in the kind of, the alchemy of it. So that's been a really beautiful exercise. I'm really proud of Fallen Tree because I, I didn't purposely come here to set up a studio at the yeah. gallery. I just came here to kind of retire and all of a sudden it's like, uh, you know, I went to play in Kuala Lumpur and, uh, you know, my partner now said to me, I'm thinking about opening a studio. Do you want to do it? So that happened. So there you go. Have you been quoted by your friend to say, Cut, he's given us more than enough. No, I think he needs to change the battery on the camera. So he said, I will always kill a battery in a camera. I'll give you two minutes. I'm yeah, enjoying yeah. myself. So I'll give you two minutes to change your camera. How about that? Five seconds. Oh, it's five seconds. There we go, we're done. Yeah. Ah, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> the main main things for me is weird that it's it's just followed me around like um you know Fallen Tree One Hundred. I mean what's surprising about Fallen Tree One Hundred is that Fallen Tree became the soundtrack label for Cine Tempore, which is now written six episodes. Um, yeah. drama, drama, which has been my life, it's been my life. I mean, that was always the plan for me, that when Timeless was made, I would make Timeless the film, which was going to be three hours long. And of course, you can't do three hours long unless you're P.T. Anderson, and you can really kill it, like Magnolia, you look at La Haine, you look at anything that P.T. Anderson's done for me, is a masterpiece. You look at what, what Gondry has done also. Gondry a little bit more for me, a little bit more avant-garde, and it takes a lot of understanding of Gondry. Whereas P.T. Anderson, in terms of cinematography, was something that I really loved. But of course, the concept has always been there to make Timeless the film. Well, of course, Netflix is the new TV. You know, Disney's the new TV. There are all these different platforms now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's now six hours. It's now six hours of drama, which takes us more into Shakespearean you know, I now have a Shakespearean tale that I can tell over six episodes. But the difference is that you've got six hours of music, which is from me and James Davidson, which is my partner in Subjective, which is phenomenal. It's probably the best music I've made in my life. You know, along with different attributes from, that sound like Thomas, but are not. Mm -hmm. And also classical renditions of pieces that are just mind blowing. And that, that's me, it's something that I've always wanted to do as a showrunner. Um, you know, think, you know, think um, Fincher as a director, he's a showrunner. You know, you, you get directors in place that are technically, technically apt, but they can get the job done quick and you execute. And that's what I'm about. You know, I, I've never engineered in my life and refused to, but you give me four engineers and I'll bend them inside out because that's what the job is at hand in what you have to do as an alchemist. So I, I think, for me, 
the the all encompassing idea of being in Asia was very one dimensional. Me just being in the background over here. Just, yeah. Bye. Um, but also, I think going back to the point, I wanted to just reinvent because no one knows me here, which is great. Mm -hmm. I'm just Fan Tong. That's all I am, Fan Tong. Oh, Fan Tong. Yeah, he live here. That's it. So DHL, know where I am. Brilliant. And that's it. And I think that reinvention, you know, it spills out sometimes. You go to Bangkok and there's somebody there, or whatever. Or, but especially when the country's closed, it's great. I'm just, yeah. a, I'm just away from it all. I'm, and, and it's great because you get to really reinvent. I get, to, I get to spend time with the boy. Yeah. If anyone yeah. knows me and knows about the Hoffman process and what I've been through with the Hoffman, I get to spend time with the greatest kid on earth. And he feeds me in such a way and we in, we laugh and he says, I've got a really great idea. I'm like, really? And I have to listen because, you know, before for me, I've always had 12 characters in my head that were all screaming at the same time. But one of those characters is the kid that, that, that stands underneath the table that no one listens to while they're all arguing. And now they're all seated and they have to listen to what the kid has to say. And I, I think that for me is what the art's about. Because I get one character gets up who's the artist and he has to paint. It's so weird for me that I get up and I just have to paint. Like... I don't have to think about it. It just, I goes, I'm getting up. What are you doing? I don't know. I'm painting apparently, <laughs> you know, and then I'm, I'm writing on, you know, I'm writing the series. Um, and I've been writing the series with a wonderful writer called Dan, Dan Caden, Dan Caden, we call him. It was phenomenal. I mean, he wrote Snatch and Rock oh, and Roller with Guy Ritchie. Right. Um, and you know, he's, he never really got credited, but he was a main writer and we've had such, even for him, this is like the greatest thing I've ever done. <laughs> it's like, it's like, this is, this is it. Like this TV series, like I, I kind of always say that when I do something else, but it is like, I don't mind. I, I, I don't mind if nothing else happens after this, that the end of next year, if we go into production, I've got some wonderful people. Stephen Graham's the main lead, you know, his wife, Anna's involved big time she's the only person outside I mean then who's read it and has gone this is just mind-blowing and it really is you know if Heineken did origami in Goldie's life story then this would be it <laughs> um, because it is the origami of my life in all of the characters that I've ever been and all of the people that were bad and good mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful Say again? Would you film it in Thailand? Oh no, God no! It's it's a story of England. It's a story of New York. It's a story of it follows my life very very closely to to where I, in my environment of where I've grown up. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's something whether you want to edit it out because you might not have enough time for your people that do we this have stuff all, all the time. <laughs> I just think that if you do something, you do it thoroughly. That's all. For sure, yeah. Do you have a good art set up at your home then in Phuket? Do you have like a... Did oh, you God, yeah, I mean, if you want to, I mean, I could possibly... Because techno isn't technology amazing? It's great, yeah. And isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I might be able to do this somehow. I think you can. You see, if you were to send me an invite, I could probably... Mm. I could probably... Hmm. Yeah, I think it's here. Or well, it's not, actually. I could show you. I've got a great setup. My setup's mm -hmm. amazing. I wasn't going to give this interview. Oh, this interview is going to be 15 minutes, by the way. It's now turning into a fucking interview fest. Oh, oh. no, thank you so much. You can go anytime. <laughs> oh, answer what, any questions you need. To, your man needs to ask, uh, you know, there seems to be a couple of questions tinkering in his mind here i don't think so i think it's i think it's mostly me to be honest because um okay. Jaron, did you want to ask anything no um uh what i did want to say was how has um how has bangkok reacted to the gallery and its presence what's been the feedback i mean it's been amazing i mean we you know vils we've practically sold all of vils's work which was kind wow. of like 
Vils is gone. I mean, literally, I think there's two Vils pieces left. He has a show at Magnus that started today, which is going to be probably the most, probably the most penultimate show in his life. I mean, that show is going to sell out in Paris. It's happening now. It's just huge. And I've managed, because I've, you know, because Bill's features heavily in the documentary and he's a very good friend. Um, and he said, look, I want this, you know, this work, we've got to get it to you. So we've just got a new consignment, which is going to drop before Christmas, which is huge. And it's all 2020 work. You know, the work that we sold was kind of 2018, 2019. So we have a new, we have all of these new, new stuff, which is just being shown in Paris. So it's kind of special, really. Yeah. I mean, the, the response to Berlin has been incredible. The, the response to the gallery generally, yeah, you know, Flash's piece is selling was a surprise. You know, like I said, we, we're sitting on a lot of work that we, we love because there's no fear for us to sell it. You know, the idea of the, the work, you know, of course we'd love to. It's great. It's a gallery, of course. But what I love about it is there's such great stories behind the art. You know, it's not like, I don't I don't need like 20 fit birds, you know what I mean? Coming to me with a glass of champagne trying to sell me a painting, do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a great gallery with great work, yeah. uh, with great covenants. Mm -hmm. You know, you buy, yeah. if you want to flip it in a couple of years, it's going to make money. It's great in that respect as an investment. But the high end stuff is really flipped a lot, really well, you know? And, and to be honest, those people have bought those Vils and bought those Berlins and bought my stuff are like, they love the art yeah. and they're actually, they're like, shit, I think they're going to come back again. Um, which is, which is great. Um, but even though it's not Matt Adams, who's unknown, you know, Matt stuff's just sold. It's gone now. I think we went to the last one. So the response has been amazing. And of course, you know, I did a little bit of homework sniffing around before at contemporary galleries and I felt that they were very small and I get it because there's no risk involved. Um, we have a great setup with the landlady. Um, they're great with us. The fact there's another gallery down the, that, that two doors down. They're great. It's a great gallery. Oh, nice. Please go visit if you come to Orem. Yeah, it's brilliant. Some beautiful stuff in there. And I think that a bar's just opened around the corner. I mean, for me, it reminds me of Brooklyn. When I was in Brooklyn in like 98, it was nothing really going on. And it just started to blow up. You know what I mean? And I think the area is very much like Shoreditch, very much like Brooklyn, very like the Meatpacking District in Lower East Side. It's getting that real good feel to the area. You know, Jude, the bar's really lovely. You know, got great sake there. And, you know, that's where I am. You'll find me there on a Saturday night. You know what I mean? In Jew Bar. <laughs> um, and I just love, I just love the area. I just feel something about the area that I really love. Mm -hmm. And how's Paquette at the moment? Are you enjoying it being quiet? It's been the best. It's like rainy season and it's like out of season when no one's here. I mean, I pretty much, I hike, you know, I pretty much hike, um, you know, I hike four times a week. I started today, tomorrow. I was, I was told you have to have a time off if you don't, <laughs> you know, you're just going to melt. Um, and it was great. Today was great. A lot of snakes today. So I, I trod carefully today. There's a lot of big snakes around today, but, um, rainy season, they're all out looking for food. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was great. It was great. And there's a, there's a natural lake at the top and you're just getting that lake, man. And it's just rejuvenating. And, you know, I, I think what's been great. I've been going up there shooting underwater and shooting from above with a drone. Oh, nice. With a great guy with a great, great guy called Peter, who lives on the island from Poland. He's a phenomenal photographer and a great video, video grabber, a videographer. And um, I'm doing an Adrift video for Timeless, which I always felt there was, you know, obviously no connection, but, but of course I did Journeyman here entirely. Um, but being able to do an Adrift video and go to this place and swim to a rock, to sit on the rock, <laughs> And look at this lake, which is very much what a drift's about, because a drift was about a lake and about a paper boat being blown out to the center of my drug addiction, into the center, so it was very still, into absolute stillness. And then to kind of chorus and, you know, have this great melancholy story about 
you know, what a drift is. And then one gust of wind brings it back to the shore. To be there sober and to be on this rock, it almost seems like my whole life's kind of preordained for me almost. Yeah. You know what I mean? And actually filming underwater has been mad because it's very green. So it has a very spooky era because it used to be a tin mine. So that's been an amazing thing, watching this kind of little tadpole from above <laughs> in its lake. You know, and it's also really interesting because I guess being at the gallery and being working with Fallen Tree 100, whatever tiny drop of art we do, the ripples yeah. go. And yeah. you see it from above when you're with the drone, you think, shit. All those ripples I'm creating, and it's like, yeah, that's the impact we have. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that that's what I've been finding now. You know, I'm going to be doing some live painting at the gallery, which I can't wait to do. I just oh, nice. haven't had time. Well, I want to do it because we have this cubicle, which we designed to extract. So in December, in November, when you, I hope you come along to this great, viewing we have of the documentary which is mind-blowing i must say it's just mind-blowing documentary exciting, yeah and um and i'll be painting in that, in that in that week doing a couple of live paintings which are going to be really cool and that's it really so that's me um having a rather <laughs> lovely yeah i've really very thorough, i've done my thorough zoom of the day <laughs> <laughs> um uh, me and my friend did a live painting of you and LTJ Bookham at a festival on Koh Samui. Oh, wow. Okay. I, can't remember what the festival I never got to see that. I think you maybe saw it on Instagram and we were like, oh. But um, just while you're here, Goldie, <laughs> I'm just going to ask a question that's just come to my mind just from talking. And I hope you don't think I'm being like, poor me or um, anything. But I paint. But one mm. thing I've been struggling with is I have a one-year-old son, so I've had a baby, things are getting a bit easier. But what would yeah. be your advice? Um, you're like maybe 20 years older than me, so it you okay. know it gives me, actually maybe people in their 50s are at their peak. <laughs> because what would be yeah. your advice for people who are like, because it really, because I can't paint as much, I can maybe paint once a week at the moment. You know, what would okay. be your advice for someone like myself who's struggling to find the time because of family or baby and you know it really um, it my advice, my, okay my <laughs> advice to you would be would be one of the one of the the great things about that is is our expectations of painting so for example i will spend if, if you get a canvas together let's say i don't know if 70 by 50 might seem to be the size that most young artists are painting on you know, I'm 125 by 100. It's just my standard size, the smallest mm -hmm. thing I'll ever work on. But the idea of painting a background, just the background, just the atmosphere of the mind, if you like, is always the thing. Because everyone tries to, you know, we try and do this thing where we, we always try and do this thing where we kind of go, right, I, I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm going to do this kind of like, this character here, and I'm going to do this background, I'm going to do this thing, and... And, 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 and what you don't do is to understand that what you have to do is to, is to, is to if you have the, the whole thing as this rectangle, you just paint the whole bloody thing so that it has a bed of the mind, if you like. I call it the bed mm -hmm. of the mind. Mm -hmm. And once you have that bed of the mind, you can go, right, so what is it going to be? Is it going to be abstract? Is it going to be portraiture? Is it going to be character? So it's always good to get what Tony Caldwell is a great example. Yeah. She'll get loads yeah. of photographs from Vogue and stuff and things, and she'll do her own Pinterest to the side, and she'll put all these images there. And you can just look at those images and draw a caricature that might be made up of four or five pieces of this situation. And then, you know, commit yourself to the medium you're working in. You know, acrylic's obviously the go to thing for a lot of artists because it dries very quickly. But also understand that once you've filled in your background, you know, you've got to put your base, you know, if you've got a character outline, you put your base layer. Don't try and, I'm trying to do all the tones at the same time. Yeah. It's all about building. A, a, re, a really good idea is to, is to look at people. Um, God, who was the, there's a wonderful, there's a couple of great artists. If you look at Tony's work and you look at, 
Matt Adams, or you look, if you, what is your subject matter? That's, that's, I don't know right at the moment. No, no. Well, that's, that's what it is. You don't, you don't actually know. So, so yeah. therefore, doing, doing something with the bed of the mind to create a kind of palette. Yeah. And then thinking, well, I want to paint a kind of face of some sort. So then, you know, you've got to put the whole colour in first and then start yeah. to really just lay out and look at... Don't be scared to kind of work with charcoal as a basis of shading to kind of get get, get shaped together and stuff. In the way that Bacon, Francis Bacon, was very much into creating these really mad, mad shapes. Like, you look at Whittaker as well. He's a great artist to, to look at. Whittaker is amazing. But I think you've got to really be comfortable in the medium because the, the thing is with artists that don't know what they're painting, I get it because he's like, I just want to see where it goes. Mm. But the idea of treating it by pa like painting by numbers, that's what stencil art does. It's paint by numbers, it's easy. So the idea of tone and texture, it's the idea of thinking, I don't care if it's the shape looks like a face, but it's not. Getting the idea of tone and texture is very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just started painting these really mad abstracts, like really layered. Yeah. But they're so layered. But I'd never got into these idea of shards, shards, or the idea of fractures in my mind. You know, something I'd never really done. It was the idea of it was it was called um, it was the idea of um, it was a lullaby of Birdland. It was this idea of this this bird, you know, in this in this kind of colourful rainbow I place, but it was kind of fractured. But the amount of depth it, it has, even though I've covered the entire background, because yeah. Because this background was only this pink here that yeah. was literally a wash. It was just like I had the canvas, I painted it like light blue with grey, and I literally just got a wash of pink and I just threw it on, smeared it all over and did some really beautiful strokes, but then I just poured turpentine all over it. Like, you know, the classic Thailand spirit, it's not strong enough. <laughs> you use it for cleaning and it's very watered down. You buy it from a thrifty store, it's fuck all. If you pour that stuff on canvas, it almost immerses like ink and then you just rinse it off and you let it dry in the sun, which dries very quickly. Mm -hmm. It creates a very great mottled background, which then allowed me to then do the, the green. Then the next layer was the green layer. Yeah. Just I had just one great shape. That was just one mad shape. And as soon as I did that, I went, right, now I'm going to do you know, the, 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 the outline of that shape, but I'm going to do this bird shape, which is the other abstract shape, and then I'm going to do all the shards last. So you've just got to work and understand that it, you have to have patience with the art. Yeah. And just work in like just working in layers, just layers. Mm -hmm. You just got, it's really, if you're working in acrylic. Yeah, and household you know, things, because we're in, on Copanyan. <laughs> Well, yes, yeah, so you can get, you know, white paint and just add different colours to it to create the colours and washes. You can get this thin turpentine stuff, which you pour it on it from a great height and it lands and it clean. Oh, it's got a great effect. And just, just, just watch that, you know, do it flat so it kind of creates these great bubbles and shapes. And then you just literally rinse it with a hose from above and it'll just wash it out. And it will great, give you some great textual backgrounds where you think that's interesting and yeah. start turning it around and looking at it and just see where the mind follows. Trust the mind mm. and the heart will, you know, as, you know, you, you got to trust the mind in, in, in how abstract it is. Mm -hmm. You know, like the same way that we dream. Yeah. What was that about? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mad shit. So just follow the mind a little bit and then the heart will follow. Yeah. I think it's just the change of life from the freedom to, you know, producing like tons of work to only being able to produce like well you've got the best greatest piece of work which is a child there's no better art piece than that exactly. so maybe do sketches of your maybe do sketches of your, your child from a side profile whatever it may be that's yeah. always a great subject matter to be inspiring but baby <laughs>